You are listening to No Borders Radio, and I'll be your host for the next two hours. The National Security Act of 1947, July 26, 1947. To promote the national security by providing for a Secretary of Defense, for a national military establishment, for a Department of the Army, a Department of the Navy, and a Department of the Air Force, and for the coordination of the activities of the national military establishment with other departments and agencies of the government concerned with national security, be it enacted by the Senate and the House of Representatives of the United States of America and Congress assembled. This act may be cited as the National Security Act of 1947. Declaration of Policy Section 2 In enacting this legislation, it is the intent of Congress to provide a comprehensive program for the future security of the United States Incorporated to provide for the establishment of integrated policies and procedures for the departments, agencies, and functions of the government relating to the national security, to provide three military departments for their operation and administration of the Army, the Navy, including Naval Aviation and the United States Incorporated Marine Corps and the Air Force, with their assigned combat and service components, to provide for the authoritative coordination, and unified direction under civilian control, but not to merge them, to provide for the effective strategic direction of the armed forces and for their operation under unified control and for their integration into an efficient team of land, naval, and air forces. Title I, Coordination for National Security, the National Security Council, Section 101. There is hereby established a council to be known as the National Security Council, here and after in this section referred to as the Council. The President of the United States shall preside over meetings of the Council, provided that in his absence he may designate a member of the Council to preside in his place. The function of the Council shall be to advise the President with respect to the integration of domestic, foreign, and military policies relating to the national security so as to enable the military services and other departments and agencies of the government to cooperate more effectively in matters involving the national security. Council shall be composed of the President, the Secretary of State, the Secretary of Defense, appointed under Section 202, the Secretary of the Army, referred to in Section 205, the Secretary of Navy, the Secretary of Air Force, appointed under Section 207, and the Chairman of National Security Resource Board, appointed under Section 103, and such of the following named officers as the President may designate from time to time. The Secretaries of the Executive Departments, the Chairman of the Munitions Board, appointed under Section 213, and the Chairman of the Research and Development Board, appointed under Section 214. But no such additional member shall be designated until the office. Advice and consent of the Senate has been given to the appointment to the office the holding of which authorizes his designation as a member of the Council. In addition to performing such other function as the President may direct for the purpose of more effectively and coordinating the policies and functions of the Department and agencies of the government relating to the national security, it shall, subject to the direction of the President, be the duty of the Council to 1. to assess and appraise the objectives, commitments, and risks of the United States Incorporated in relation to our actual and potential military power in the interests of national security for the purpose of making recommendations to the President in connection therewith, and two, to consider policies on matters of common interest to the departments and agencies of the government concerned with the national security, and to make recommendations to the President in connection therewith. The Council shall have a staff to be headed by a civilian executive secretary who shall be appointed by the President and who shall receive compensation at a rate of $10,000 a year. The executive secretary subject to the direction of the Council is hereby authorized subject to the Civil Service Laws and the Classification Act of 1923 as amended to appoint and fix the compensation of such personnel as may be necessary to perform such duties as may be prescribed by the Council in connection with the performance performance of its functions. The Council shall from time to time make such recommendations and such other reports to the President as it deems appropriate or as the President may require. 
Central Intelligence Agency, or CIA, Section 102. A. There is hereby established under the National Security Council a Central Intelligence Agency with a Director of Central Intelligence who shall be the head thereof. The Director shall be appointed by the President by and with the advice and consent of the Senate from among the commissioned officers of the armed services or from among individuals in civilian life. From the Guardian.com, Underwear Barmer was working for the CIA. Bomber involved in plot to attack U.S. bound jet was working as an informer with Saudi intelligence and the CIA. It has emerged. Scared you, didn't it? And this was not according to state security, which would be you. This is according to national security policy maintained by Congress. They are putting you into fear so that they can protect you, but they're the ones preying on you. National security applies to corporate policy. It's a corporation. A foreign nation is not a sovereign state. 28 U.S.C. Subsection 1603 For the purposes of this chapter, a foreign state, except as used in Section 1608 of this title, includes a political subdivision of a foreign state or an agency or instrumentality of a foreign state as defined in Subsection B. B. An agency or instrumentality of a foreign state means any entity which is a separate legal person corporate or otherwise, and two, which is an organ of a foreign state or political subdivision thereof, or a majority of whose shares or other ownership interests is owned by a foreign state or political subdivision thereof, and three, which is neither a citizen of a state of the United States as defined in section 1332 C and E of this title, nor created under the laws of any third country. The United States Incorporated includes all territory and waters, continental or insular subject to the jurisdiction of the United States Incorporated. D. A commercial activity means either a regular course of commercial conduct or a particular commercial transaction or act. The commercial character of an activity shall be determined by reference to the nature of the course of conduct or particular transaction or, or act rather than by reference to its purpose. A commercial activity carried on in the United States incorporated by a foreign state means commercial activity carried on by such state and having substantial contact with the United States incorporated. From Amateur 2D Bills and Notes 1. Definitions Nature of Commercial Paper Subsection 1. Generally Bills and Notes in their various forms are contracts and may be negotiable or non-negotiable. Bills and notes are commonly defined as commercial paper or negotiable or non-negotiable instruments. 2. An internal commercial paper. Commercial paper is commonly defined as negotiable instruments, drafts, checks, certificates of deposits, and promissory notes. Commercial paper is governed by provisions in, of Article 3 of the Uniform Commercial Code. Subsection 2. Contractual nature of negotiable instruments. Bills and notes are in modern terminology drafts, checks, notes, and certificates of deposits or contracts. Accordingly, the fundamental rules governing contract law are applicable to the determination of the legal questions which arise over such instruments. An instrument may be negotiable, and while not removed from the law relating to contracts, such an instrument constitutes a commercial specialty. A negotiable instrument is distinguished from an ordinary contract by incidents having their foundation in the law merchant, which in most jurisdictions has been in large part codified by statute, first in the Uniform Negotiable Instruments Acts and subsequently in the Uniform Commercial Code. Subsection 3. Generally, the law merchant. The law merchant is the law which confers negotiability on commercial paper and governs negotiable instruments. More specifically, it is the pre-statutory or non-statutory law which govern bills of exchange, promissory notes, and namely the lex mercatoria or the custom of merchants. Subsection 4. Uniform Negotiable Instruments Act. The Uniform Commercial Code supplanted the Uniform Negotiable Instrument Act, which was promulgated in 1896 as the first uniform law by the National Conference of Commissioners on Uniform State Laws and was in force in all of the states of the United States 
until superseded. The act was largely a codification of the rules of the law merchant or the common law rules relating to negotiable instruments which previously were in force and effect by virtue of judicial pronouncement or legislative enactment. Its purpose was to establish for certain fixed rules governing negotiable instruments and to bring about a uniform system of laws on the subject and thereby do away with the confusion that had existed in the law of commercial paper. The Uniform Commercial Code, Subsection 5. The Uniform Commercial Code has been enacted, at least in part, by every state in the United States Incorporated and by the District of Columbia and the Virgin Islands. The Uniform Commercial Code is arranged in 10 articles. Article 1 contains general provisions, Article 10 is the effective date and repealer article, and Articles 2 through 9 are each concerned with a particular type of commercial activity. The Code as a whole is known and may be cited as the Uniform Commercial Code. The Uniform Commercial Code, as proposed by its sponsors, the American Law Institute and the National Conference of Commissioners on Uniform State Laws, is accompanied by extensive comments, explanatory of and correlating the various code provisions. From Black's Law 8th edition, Jerry Justionis, by way of doing business, a nation's acts that are essentially commercial or private in contrast to its public or governmental acts. Under the Foreign Sovereign Immunities Act, a foreign country's immunity is limited to claims involving its public acts. The statutory immunity does not extend to claims arising from the private or commercial acts of a foreign state. 28 U.S.C.A. subsection 1605 See Commercial Activity Exception Restrictive Principle of Sovereign Immunity. Jury and Perry. Jury and Perry is by right of sovereignty. The public acts that a nation undertakes as a sovereign state for which the sovereign is usually immune from suit or liability in a foreign country. Again, see the Restrictive Principle of Sovereign Immunity. The Restrictive Principle of Sovereign Immunity. The doctrine by which a foreign nation's immunity does not apply to claims arising from the nation's private or commercial acts, but protects the nation only from claims arising from its public functions. Uniform Commercial Code is just a conglomeration of private and commercial acts. You just saw it in Amger itself. What the hell are we consenting to this stuff for? The United States Incorporated is a corporation. They're only adhering and acting as to acts of commerce and private acts which disallow immunity or any amount of sovereignty. You are the United States lower case and you are with full sovereignty and immunity. You only adhere to the public law, meaning do no harm. So we went into depth on the 1947 National Security Act and we need to go further along on the timeline to see the fallout of this or the expected result, the predetermined outcome. On April 24, 1974, Dr. Henry Kissinger proposed in his memorandum to the National Security Council that depopulation should be the highest priority of United States incorporated foreign policy towards the third world. He quoted reasons of national security and because the U.S. economy will require large and increasing amounts of minerals from abroad, especially from less developed countries. Wherever a lessening of population can increase its prospects for such stability, population policy becomes relevant to resources, supplies, and to the economic interests of the United States Incorporated. This is what launched the depopulation program. The targeting agency for the operation is the National Security Council's ad hoc group on population policy. Its policy planning group as in the U.S. State Department's Office of Population Affairs established in 75 by Henry Kissinger. The OPA, or Office of Population Affairs, is actually the United States Department of Health and Human Services. OPA is a leader in family planning and reproductive health care services training and research. Okay. Now this all began as eugenics or genocide, but now it's soft sold to you as family planning because it sounds nicer. From blackgenocide.com, 
Sorry. At a March 1925 25 international birth control gathering in New York City, a speaker warned of the menace posed by the black and yellow peril. The man was not a Nazi or Klansman. He was Dr. S. Adolphus Knopf, a member of Margaret Sanger's American Birth Control League, ABCL, which along with other groups eventually became known as Planned Parenthood. I'm going to make you pause here because you need to realize this is 1925, well before Hitler. Now during this time, corporations were just taking a heavy, heavy burden of all of these populaces and all of these human beings and the overhead was really really great and so such as Bear Corporation came in in 1927 July 26 1927 to ask the World Courts which is maintained by Congress to indemnify Poland it had nothing to do with racism it was corporate overhead that they wanted to cut there's a permanent link here www.worldcourts.com PCIJ slash ENG slash decisions slash nineteen twenty seven dot o seven dot two six space chores out C H O R Z O W dot H T M. The citation is Factory at Chores out in parentheses Germany versus Poland nineteen twenty seven PCIG series A number nine. July 26. So what is really the US Department of Health and Servi Human Services? It's a eugenics program. So when you're seeing this from Russia today, for example, NSA bugged UN headquarters in a report, that's to throw you off because what's actually occurring is information. You're applying for welfare. You're applying for Social Security. You're applying for licensing and titles. And what this is, is that is the National Security Pro Program. You are the underwriter underwriting policy. You are guaranteeing these revenue streams through the insurance schematic, subject to their laws, because you're still claiming to be a citizen of this corporation. You can only be a product of a corporation. All right, and here's an example of corporate policy gone awry from the LATimes.com. Rival campers who open fire turn out to be sheriff's deputies. Feuding LA County deputies, both off duty at Prado Regional Park, apparently didn't know they were colleagues, and they didn't realize that they weren't shooting at or around citizens. And now they're apologetic because they were shoot shooting at each other. However, what about citizens? They have a directive to uh, off citizens. An apparent booze filled dispute over loud music between two girl groups at a Chino campground over the weekend escalated to the point where men from both sides drew guns and opened fire. No one was hurt, but the two alleged gunmen had plenty to explain. It turns out that the rival gun toting campers were both Los Angeles County Sheriff's deputies. Authorities suspect the off-duty co cops learned they were colleagues only after their campground showdown. Absolutely. It's okay to, to do that to citizens, but it's not okay to do that to each other, right? This is sick. What the hell is everybody still doing consenting to this stuff? And an update on the veteran uh, that was deployed during the time that his child was being adopted out by the state um, from the TulsaWorld.com. Adoptive parents visit baby Veronica, but future visits being challenged. Now here's a scary part. A GAL is normally a pedophile. In a flurry of activity that came Friday at the Cherokee County Courthouse, the Capabiancos appeared to be objecting to the appointment of a guardian ad litem to represent their adoptive daughter's best interest during the court proceedings. A gag order remains in effect and the court records are sealed, making few details available other than the court docket, which gives only a brief description of the orders and motions. Judge Wells signed a writ of habeas corpus that brought the cop Biancos and Veronica's biological family together for a three-hour hearing August 16th. She also imposed the gag order, preventing the public from knowing much about what happened at the hearing. Now, gag orders protect pedophiles. It stops the public from seeing what's going on behind the scenes, and we need to do something about this. If you don't stand up, who protects us? 
the predator. The state's just racking in that revenue. They're generating revenue off of the baby, off of the adoptive parents, off of the biological parents that are fighting this. Everybody needs to keep their eyes open and watch what's going on. This is human trafficking. Congress is soft selling its drone use from Reuters.com. Archaeologists use drones in Peru to map and protect sites. So they're soft selling this, this eugenics program as a scientific based research program. Again from Reuters.com, Canon spies opportunity in surveillance as camera growth cools. So as they're losing business on one side, Canon's drumming it up on the other by entering into this surveillance program opportunity. Pretty sure it's time to boycott Canon and its uh, programming. Now this guy was killed by cops to protect him from killing himself. From the Guardian.com, man dies after police taser incident. Man in Plymouth was doused in a flammable liquid when police were called out to investigate a domestic disper disturbance. A man has died after suffering horrific burns in an incident when he was tasered by a police officer while doused in a flammable liquid. Police were called to the home of 32-year-old Andrew Pl Pimlot in Plymouth following a domestic disturbance and told that he was in the garden and had a can of flammable liquid with him. An officer discharged a taser and according to eyewitnesses, Pimlot was seen fully on fire from top to bottom. One of the officers jumped on him to try to put out the flames. So they lit him on fire to protect him from himself. I think they're pretty nice, aren't they, according to national policy? Here's a lesson for everybody. A report from WRDW.com. Sister of a man who died in taser incident works in law enforcement. Now this guy flagged down police to help him and ended up dying at their hands. He's the one that called them out to help him. Stop calling them out to help you. They are privateers, they're business licensed privateers. Their function is to kill you or drag you in front of admiralty courts for condemnation and sale. This is all maintained by the board of commissioners or corporate council. They know who's who, they know what your value is. If there's value in putting you in an institution or in a prison or through the medical or psychological industry, you'll go there. If there's no value in it and you're better off dead, and more uh, efficient according to death derivatives, they're going to kill you. From IntelliHub.com Police tase man for trying to rescue his baby from fire. Baby does not make it. They stopped him from saving that child. And now a child is dead. Obama Martyrs mark 50th anniversary of civil rights turning point from CNN.com Commemorating the long fight toward racial equality that many say hasn't ended, marchers on the National Mall on Wednesday, including President Barack Obama, commemorated the 50th anniversary of Reverend Martin Luther King Jr.'s I Have a Dream speech. On that August day in 1963, when King and his fellow marchers attended what he labeled the greatest demonstration for freedom in the history of our nation, few in that crowd could have imagined that half a century later, an African-American president of the United States would mark the occasion with a speech in the same location. From supplementary re detailed staff reports of intelligence activities and the rights of Americans, Book 3, final report of the Select Committee to stu Study Governmental Operations with respect to intelligence activities, United States Senate, April 23, 1976, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., Case Study, Introduction. From December 1963 until his death in 1968, Martin Luther King Jr. was the target of an intensive campaign by the Federal Bureau of Investigation to neutralize him as an effective civil rights leader. In the words of the man in charge of the FBI's war against Dr. King, quote, no holds were barred. We have used similar techniques against Soviet agents. The same methods were brought home against any organization against which we were targeted. We did not differentiate. This is rough, tough business. The FBI collected information about Dr. King's plans and activities through an extensive surveillance program employing nearly every intelligence gathering technique at the Bureau's disposal. Wiretaps, which were initially approved by Attorney General Robert F. Kennedy, were maintained on Dr. King's home telephone from October 1963 until mid-1965. The SCLC headquarters telephones were covered by wiretaps for an even longer period. 
Phones in the homes and offices of some of Dr. King's close advisors were also wiretapped. The FBI has acknowledged 16 occasions on which microphones were hidden in Dr. King's hotel and motel rooms in an attempt to, to obtain information about the private activities of King and his advisors were used to completely discredit them. FBI informants in the civil rights movement and reports from field offices kept the Bureau's headquarters informed of developments in the civil rights field. The FBI's presence was so intrusive that one major figure in the civil rights movement testified that his colleagues referred to themselves as members of the FBI's Golden Record Club. The FBI's formal program to discredit Dr. King with government officials began with the distribution of a monograph which the FBI realized would be regarded as a personal attack on Martin Luther King and which was subsequently described by a Justice Department official as personal diatribe, a personal attack without evidentiary support. Now remember, the Department of Justice is over the FBI, so they knew exactly what was going on. They're playing Heigl here. Congressional leaders were warned off the record about alleged dangers posed by Reverend King. Wow, does that sound familiar or what? The FBI responded to Dr. King's receipt of the Nobel Peace Prize by attempting to undermine his reception by foreign heads of state and American ambassadors in the countries that he planned to visit. When Dr. King returned to the United States, steps were taken to reduce support for a huge banquet and a special day that were being planned in his honor. Now to realize what's going on here, we have to go to the creation of the Ku Klux Klan. Uh, six well-educated Confederate veterans from Pulaski, Tennessee, created the original Ku Klux Klan on December 24, 1865 during the reconstruction of the South after the Civil War. Now, the Confederacy is the federal government. That is what the FBI comes from, Federal Bureau of Investigation, stems through the federal government, the Confederacy, the criminal conspiracy from Black's Law Dictionary, first edition, Confederacy. In criminal law, the association or banding together are two or more persons for the purpose of committing an act or furthering an enterprise which is forbidden by law or which, though lawful in itself, becomes unlawful when made the object of the confederacy. Conspiracy is a more technical term for this offense. The federal government created the KKK and racism. It tried to take out Dr. King because he was speaking out against racism and he knew what was going on and eventually they had to kill him. They had no other option. So the next time you see Gray Hitler there standing up for the rights of Americans, don't believe it. He's Gray Hitler. He's not black. He's not white. He's not Muslim. He's not Christian. He's just Gray Hitler, and nobody realizes what he's doing. National security dictates that we have to be polarized from each other in order for them to offset congressional bankruptcy by taking all of us in there into the system and using us to do so. From the Assassination Archives and Research Center. Interim report, alleged assassination plots involving foreign leaders. Part 2, covert action as a vehicle for foreign policy implementation. Covert action is activity which is meant to further the sponsoring nation's foreign policy objectives and to be concealed in order to permit that nation to plausibly deny responsibility. The National Security Act of 1947, which established the Central Intelligence Agency, did not include specific authority for covert operations. However, it created the National Security Council and gave that body authority to direct the CIA to perform such other functions and duties related to intelligence affecting the national security as the National Security Council may from time to time direct. At its first meeting in December 1947, the National Security Council issued a top secret directive granting the CIA authority to conduct covert operations. From 1955 to 1970, the basic authority for covert operations was a directive of the National Security Council's NSC 5412-2. This directive instructed the CIA to counter, reduce, and discredit international communism throughout the world in a manner consistent with the United States foreign policy, states foreign and military policies. It also directed the CIA to undertake covert operations to achieve this and 
and define covert operations as any covert activities related to propaganda, economic warfare, political action, including sabotage, demolition, and assistance to resistance movements, and all activities compatible with this directive. In 1962, the CIA's General Counsel rendered the opinions that the agency's activities were not inhibited by any limitations other than those broadly set forth in NSC 5412-2, CIA General Counsel Memorandum of uh, April 6, 1962. Now, Rick Perry is traded as the general counsel, by the way. Rick Perry is also Health and Human Services, United States Department of, listed as a corporation on Dun & Bradstreet, General Counsel Law PC, Plano, and Office of the General Counsel, Huntsville, Texas. And this is right on Dun & Bradstreet, if you go to Dun & Bradstreet, dnb.com. Now, what does this mean to you? Now, most of our listeners are probably scratching their head and wondering why I went off on to Rick Perry. Now, from Black's Law Dictionary, 8th edition, Gubernator Novice, is the pilot or steersman of a ship. The Gubernator Novice could be sued for damages if he negligently caused a collision. Judas means with law. Jesus means your earth or your vessel there and you have a pilot or steersman steering it. The etymology on ecumenical means representing the entire parentheses Christian and parentheses world formed in English as an ecclesiastical word from the late Latin oecumenicus meaning general such as the general council. So the National Security Act is actually a rule book on how to crucify Jesus again and I'll continue reading from covert action as a vehicle for foreign policy implementation in his 1962 memorandum CIA's general counsel made it clear that the CIA considered itself responsible for developing proposals and plans to implement the objectives of National Security Council 5412-2 the memorandum also stated that even in developing ideas or plans it was incumbent on the agency not only to coordinate with other executive departments and agencies, but also to obtain necessary policy approval. The committee has been faced with determining whether the CIA officials thought it was necessary to obtain express approval for assassination plans, and if so, whether such approval was in fact either sought or granted. Now, we need to stop right there and look at such as Saddam Hussein, because it was the CIA that came out and said there's weapons of mass destruction, they reported to everybody there were never any weapons of mass destruction. They only wanted to go into that country to implement such as the Federal Reserve, Fractional Reserve Banking, and use the sheeple to offset congressional bankruptcy. It's all the same game. Beginning in 1955, the responsibility for authorizing CIA covert action operations lay with a special group, a subcommittee of the National Security Council composed of the President's Assistant for National Security Affairs, the Director of Central Intelligence, the Deputy Secretary of Defense, and the Under Secretary of State for Political Affairs. Today this group is known as the 40 Committee and its membership has been expanded to include the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. During 1962 another National Security Council subcommittee was established to oversee co covert operations in Cuba. This subcommittee was a special group augmented. Its membership included the special group, the Attorney General, and certain other high officials. In exercising control over co covert operations, the special group was charged with considering the objectives of proposed activities, determining whether the activities would accomplish the objectives, assessing the likelihood of success, and deciding whether the activities would be proper and in the national interest. The chairman of the special group was usually responsible for determining which projects require presidential consideration and for keeping him abreast of developments. Authorization procedures, however, have not always been clear and tidy, nor have they always been followed. Prior to 1955, there were few formal procedures. Procedures from 1955 through 1963 were ch characterized in an internal CIA memorandum as, quote, somewhat cloudy and based on value judgments by the DCI. 
The existence of formal procedures for planning and implementing covert actions does not necessarily rule out the possibility that other more informal procedures might be used. The granting of authority to an executive agency to plan covert action does not preempt presidential authority to develop and mandate foreign policy. Formal procedures may be disregarded by either high administration officer, officials or officers in the CIA. In the Snyder incident, for example, President Nixon instructed CIA officials not to consult with the 40 committee or other policy-making bodies. In the plot to assassinate Castro using underworld figures, CIA officials decided not to inform the special group of their activities. One CIA operation, an aspect of which was to develop an, an assassination capability, was assigned to a senior case officer as a special task. His responsibility to develop this capability did not fall within the special group's review or covert of covert operations, even though the same officer was responsible to the special group augmented on other matters. The Central Intelligence Agency also has a formal chain of command. At the top of the structure of the CIA is the Director of Central Intelligence, or DCI. His immediate subordinate, the Deputy Director of Central Intelligence, or DDCCI. Together, they are responsible for the administration and supervision of the agency. Beneath the DCI and directly responsible to him are, four, are the four operational component, components of the agency. During the period covered by this report, the component responsible for clandestine operations was the Directorate of Plans, headed by the Deputy Director of Plans, or DDP. The Directorate of Plans was organized around re regional geographic divisions. These divisions worked with their respective overseas stations headed by the Chief of Station, or COS, in planning and implementing the direct Directorate's operations. The divisions which played a part in the events considered in this report were the Western Hemisphere Division, WHI, which was responsible for Latin America, the African Division, AF, and the Far Eastern Division, or FE. Now everybody needs to realize here, while we pause for a moment, that education is a covert operation. Education pits you and your brother against each other, teaches you culture, social beliefs, social dynamics, religious construct, and a myriad of everything else. Education itself, that is the indoctrination program to get you to go along with the system. That is a covert operation under low intensity conflict. In addition to the regional divisions, the Directorate of Plans also included three staff level units which provided some oversight and coordination of division projects. The staff units had no approval authority over the divisions. However, they could criticize and suggest modifications of projects sponsored by divisions. The three staffs were foreign intelligence, counterintelligence, and covert action. So what you see here is like tendrils or fingers coming off of an arm, basically. When functioning in accordance with stated organizational procedures, the Directorate of Plans operated under a graduated approval process. Individual projects propo project proposals generally originated either from the field stations or from the divisions and were approved at varying levels within the Directorate depending on the estimated cost and risk of, op of the operation. Low cost, low risk projects could be approved at the deputy director for plans level. Extremely high cost, high risk projects required the approval of the DCI. Covert action proposals also required approval of the special group. Also within the directorate of plans was a technical services division or TSD which developed and provided technical and support material required in the execution of operations. A separate directorate, the Directorate of Support, handled financial and administrative manner, matters. The Office of Security, a component of the Directorate of Support, was largely responsible for pro providing protection for clandestine installations and, as discussed at length in the Castro study, was occasionally called on for operational assistance. Now we're down to B, the concept of plausible denial. Non-attribution attribution 
to the United States for covert, covert operations was the original and principal purpose of the so-called doctrine of plausible denial. Evidence before the committee clearly demonstrates that this concept designed to protect the United States and its operative from the consequences of disclosure has been expanded to mask decisions of the president and his senior staff members. A further consequence of the expansion of this doctrine is that so subordinates, in an effort to permit their superiors to plausibly deny operations, fail to fully inform them about those operations. Plausible denial has shaped the process for approving and evaluating covert actions. For example, the 40 Committee and its uh, predecessor, the Special Group, have served as circuit breakers for presidents thus avoiding consideration of covert action by the Oval Office. Plausible denial can also lead to the use of euphemism and circumlocution, which are designed to allow the President and other senior officials to deny knowledge of an operation should it be disclosed. The converse may also occur. A President could communicate his desire for a sensitive operation in an indirect circumlocutious manner. An additional possibility is that the president may, in fact, not be fully and accurately, accurately informed about a sensitive operation because he failed to receive the circumlocutious message. The evidence discussed below reveals that serious problems of assessing intent and ensuring both control and accountability may result from the use of plausible denial. Now, all of this can be lo located at www.aarclibrary.org. And we're going to recap a little bit here from CNN.com. Options, bad, worse, and even worse. Analysts, uh, any choice holds risks. President Obama cites a wide range of options in dealing with Syria. Okay, here in this thing you see John Kerry and you see President Obama up there and they're all conversing remember that they're all created from the same hand they are the same hand they are the same arm they're the same thing and combined with the National Security Act if you need to present to your sheeple that there's a bunch of terrorists first you're going to go to the Board of Governors who of course is John Kerry one of the Broadcasting Board of Governors and you're going to make up a really good story. Like Brownie over there is doing something to you. Or Blackie over there is doing something to you. Or Whitey over there is doing something to you. Or Jew. Or Zionist. Or Islamist. Or any number of ism. Judaism. Catholicism. You're going to create some conflict there. Controversy. From Black Slaw First Edition Trover. In common law practice, the action of trover, or trover and conversion, is a species of action on the case and originally lay for the recovery of damages against a person who had found another's goods and wrongfully converted them to his own use. Subsequently, the allegation of the loss of the goods by the plaintiff and the finding of them by the defendant was merely fictitious, and the action became the remedy for the wrongful interference with or detention of the goods of another. Now you've been found. That's what controversy is. It's with Trover, the action of with Trover. At that time, you are treasure trove. Treasure trove from Black's Law Dictionary, first edition. Literally, treasure found. Money or coin, gold, silver, plate, or bullion found hidden in the earth or other private place. The owner thereof being unknown. Unknown. You're still claiming that fiction, the last name. Nobody knows who owns you. For example, today on CNN.com, Congress will get its say on Syria. Now they're going into that country, they will bomb it, they will injure and harm everybody, and guess what happens? They get to find them. Let me show you. In the uh, Laws of War, Amelioration of the Condition of the Wounded on the Field of Battle, the Red Cross Convention of August 22, 1864, this set up or established foundling hospitals to find you after they hurt you so that they can cash in on your body, on, on all of the injury that happens, on all of the harm. And that includes being born in their hospitals. 
Remember, it all goes back to the insurance. It all goes back to the international classification of diseases and disorders. It all goes back to Congress. Congress is cashing in on your demise. They want to enter into Syria. They're, they're taking out Syrian government. They do that on, on purpose because if you don't have a government, they have to take you as prisoner of war under their rules. And, of course, all of this looks really charitable. We, we listen to the news when um, they're at war with what we think is another country or another set of people, and we see the charity and the refugees saved by the UN. They're not saving them. They're the ones that harm them and then save them on the back end. It's always Heigl. It is always the Heigelian dialectic. Always, always. From Reuters.com, slow pace of justice wears down Occupy Wall Street defendants. Occupy Wall Street protesters who once vowed to occupy the courts by challenging their arrests on minor violations have since been defeated by the slow pace of justice with many foregoing trial. You know, this is the premise of all of this. They can wait you out. They're playing with your money, backed by you. They've got all the time in the world, and if you don't stand up and indict them, hold them accountable for what they're doing, it just continues. You guys get bored. You guys get tired. You take some guilty pleas for non-criminal actions. They're making money left and right, raising your estates, and nothing ever happens. You have to stand up. We'll be right back after this short break. Breaking news from No Borders Radio as heard on Scottish Sovereigns on the land.neen.com. As seen on the WashingtonTimes.com, Syrian rebels use sarin ga nerve gas, not Assad's regime, UN official says. Testimony from victims strongly suggests it was rebels, not the Syrian government, that used sarin nerve gas during a recent incident in the revolution wracked nation, a senior U.S. diplomat said Monday. Carta del Ponte, a member of the UN Independent International Commission of Inquiry on Syria, told Swift's TV there were strong concrete suspicions, but not yet incontrovertible proof that rebels seeking to oust Syrian strongman Bashar Assad had used the nerve agent. This is not true. Let me show you. First of all, the Commission on Inquiry is from, it's a commission state through the U.S. Department of State, the U.S. Department of State. That is their program. The International Commission of Inquiry was um, pursuant to United Nations Security Council Resolution 1564 in 2004. That was the one on Darfur, remember all that fiasco. And of course, this is all maintained through the U.S. Department of State. John, Ch John Kerry is sitting there as the secretary. He is the clearinghouse to offset congressional bankruptcy. These people are being slaughtered by the United States Incorporated in order to offset congressional bankruptcy. If you go to whitehouse.gov right now, go to the National Security Council, and you will find that it is the United States Incorporated that runs this. Their function is depopulation. On April 24, 1974, Dr. Henry Kissinger proposed in his memorandum to the National Security Council that depopulation should be the highest priority of U.S. foreign policy towards the third world. He quoted reasons of national security and because the United States incorporated economy will require large and increasing amounts of minerals from abroad, especially from less developed countries. Wherever a lessening of population can increase the prospects for such stability, population policy becomes relevant to resources, supplies, and to the economic interests of the United States Incorporated. The targeting agency for the operation is the National Security Council's ad hoc group on population policy. Its policy planning group is in the U.S. State Department's Office of Population Affairs, established in 1975 by Henry Kissinger. The Office of Population Affairs can be found at the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, which is what that is. Low intensity conflict is the use of military forces applied selectively and with restraint to enforce compliance with policies or objectives of the political body controlling the military force. The term could be used to describe conflicts where at least one or both of the opposing parties operate along such lines. Winning hearts and minds is within that under psychological operations. Winning hearts and minds is a concept occasionally expressed in the resolution of war, insurgency, and other conflicts in which one side seeks to prevail not by the use of superior force, but by making emotional or intellectual appears to appeals 
to sway supporters of the other side, such as implicating welfare benefits, health and human services, medical insurance, social services, everything else. What they're doing is they're raising their country and then buying them or purchasing them by these concepts. I'll go on and read about the Malayan use. The use of the term hearts and minds to reference a method of bringing a subjugated population on side was first used during the Malayan emergency by the British who employed practices to keep the Malayans trust and reduce a tendency to side with the Chinese communists. In this case by giving medical and food aid to the Malays and indigenous tribes. The Office of Population Affairs is the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. This is the appearance of charity in order to perpetrate depopulation across the globe at the hands of Congress. The Broadcasting Board of Governors governs all known media, all known mainstream media, rather. So basically what that story says in the mainstream media is that somebody else is doing this other than them. John Forbes Carey, the Secretary of State, also sits on the Broadcasting Board of Governors. This is just one big uh, bamboozle against the human populace globally, when in reality it rests at the shoulders and head of Congress. Get rid of Congress. This has been a breaking news report from No Borders Radio, as heard on Scottish Sovereigns on the Land. Ning.com. From Reuters.com, emergency market pain dominates G20 economy talks. This report maintains leaders signed off on jobs and growth initiative, as well as steps to combat international tax evasion and tighten financial regulation. But concerns persisted that renewed market turbulence could hit developing economies the hardest. National Security Council, Washington, D.C., April 24, 1974. National Security Study Memorandum 200 to the Secretary of State of Defense, the Secretary of Agriculture, the Director of Central Intelligence, the Deputy Secretary of State, Administrator, Agency for International Development, Subject, Implications of Worldwide Population Growth for U.S. Security and Overseas Interests. The President has directed a study of the impact of world population growth on U.S. security and overseas interests. The study should look forward at least until the year 2000 and use several alternative reasonable projections of population growth. In terms of each projection, the study should assess the corresponding pace of development, especially in poorer countries, the demand for U.S. Ex exports, especially of food, and the trade problems the U.S. may face arising from competition for resources, and the likelihood that population growth or imbalances will product produce disruptive foreign policies and international instability. The study should focus on the international political and economic implication of population growth rather than its ecological, sociological, or other aspects. The study would then offer possible courses of action for the United States Incorporated in dealing with the population matters abroad, particularly in developing countries, with special attention to these questions. What, if any, new initiatives by the United States Incorporated are needed to focus international attention on the population pro problem? Can technological innovations or development reduce growth or ameliorate its effects? Could the United States Incorporated improve its assistance in the population field, and if so, in what form and through which agencies? Bilateral, multilateral, private? The study should take into account the President's concerns that population policy is a human concern intimately, re intimately related to the dignity of the individual and the objective of the United States Incorporated is to work closely with others rather than seek to or impose our views on others. The President has directed that the study be accomplished by the National Security Council under Secretary's Committee. The Chairman under Secretary's Committee is requested to forward the study together with the Committee's Action Recommendations no later than May 29, 1974 for consideration by the President, signed Henry A. Kissinger. NSSM 200, Implications of Worldwide Population Growth for U.S. Security and Overseas Interests, December 10, 1974. 
classified by Harry C. Blaney III, subject to general declassification schedule of Executive Order 11652, automatically downgraded at two-year intervals and declassified on December 31, 1980. This document can only be de declassified by the White House. Declassified released on July 3rd, 1989 under provisions of Executive Order 12356 by F. Grabowski, National Security Council. Executive Summary, World Demographic Trends. One, world population growth since World War II is quantitatively and qualitatively qualitatively different from any previous epoch in human history. The rapid reduction in death rates, unmatched by corresponding birth rate reductions, has brought total growth rates close to 2% a year, compared with about 1% before World War II, under 0.5% 1750 through 1900, and far lower rates before 1750. The effect is to double the world's population in 35 years instead of 100 years. Almost 80 billion are now being added each year compared with 10 million in 1900. Excuse me, almost 80 million are now being added each year compared with 10 million in 1900. 2. The second new feature of population trends is the sharp differentiation between rich and poor countries. Since 1950, population in the former group has been growing to zero at 0 to 1.5 percent per year, and in the latter, at 2.0 to 3.5%, doubling in 20 to 35 years. Some of the highest rates of increase are in areas already densely populated and with a weak resource base. 3. Because of the momentum of population dynamics, reducing reductions in birth rates affect total numbers only slowly. High birth rates in the recent past have resulted in a high proportion in the youngest age groups so that there will continue to be substantial population increases over many years, even if a two-child family should become the norm in the future. Policies to reduce fertility will have their main effects in total numbers only after several decades. However, if future numbers are to be kept within reasonable bounds, it is urgent that measures to reduce fertility be started and made effective in the in the 1970s and 1980s. Moreover, programs started now to reduce birth rates will have short-run advantages for developing countries and lower demands on food, health, and educational and other services, and enlarged capacity to contribute to productive investments, thus accelerating development. From GAO, United States General Accounting Office, Office of the Comptroller General. Human Capital, a self-assessment checklist for agency leaders. What is human capital? Simply stated, human capital means people. There are, however, two key principles that are central to the human capital idea. First, people are assets whose value can be enhanced through investment. As with any investment, the goal is to maximize value while maintaining ri managing risk. As the value of people increases, so does the performance capacity of the organization and therefore its value to clients and other stakeholders. From ACC.com, Association of Corporate Counsel. The Association of Corporate Counsel, or ACC, is a global bar association that promotes the common professional and business interests of in-house counsel who work for corporations, associations, and other private sector organizations through information, education, networking opportunities, and advocacy initiatives. From co.dodge.wi.us, Dodge County, Wisconsin Corporate Council. Purpose of the Corporation Council. The Dodge County Corporation Council is the attorney who provides legal advice to the county board, its committees, and county departments, drafts and reviews ordinances and resolutions for county board action, advises the county board with respect to parliamentary procedures, attends county committee meetings and other county related meetings, and reviews contracts in which the county is a party. The Dodge County Corporation Council prosecutes mental commitment cases, guardianship, protective placement services cases, children in need of protection or services or CHIPS cases, juveniles in need of protection or services or GIPS cases, 
termination of parental rights or TPR cases, shoreland, wetland, floodplain, and sanitary code violations, and citations issued by the Dodge County Sheriff's Department, which allege violation of a county ordinance, except for those citations which allege a violation of a county ordinance, which was has adopted Section 346.631A or Section 346. 631B of the Wisconsin statutes. The Dodge County Corporation Council Office is a central location site for the Dodge County Collection Program involving delinquent guardian ad litem fees, custody study fees, mediation fees, court appointed legal counsel fees, attorney service fees, and monies due to all county departments that require legal proceedings to collect on outstanding accounts due to Dodge County. The Dodge County Corporation Council serves as the attorney for the East Wisconsin County's Railroad Consortium and performs the duties of recording secretary for the consortium pursuant to section 59.58 and section 63.0301 of the Wisconsin statutes. The Dodge County Corporation Council office represents only Dodge County government and may not render a legal opinion or provide advice to individuals. So let's go back to Association of Corporate Counsel again. The Association of Corporate Counsel, or ACC, is a global bar association that promotes the common professional and business interests of in-house counsel who work for corporations, associations, and other private sector organizations through information, education, networking opportunities, and advocacy initiatives. What is human capital? Simply stated, human capital means people. From building criminal capital behind bars, social learning in juvenile corrections by Patrick Baer, Randy Pintoff, and David E. Posen. This paper analyzes the influence that juvenile offenders serving time in the same correctional facility have on each other's subsequent criminal behavior or capital returns. The analysis is based on data of over 8,000 individuals serving time in 169 juvenile corrections facility during a two-year period in Florida. Quote, Danbury was in a prison. It was a crime school. I went in with a bachelor of marijuana and came out with a doctorate of cocaine. From George Jung, Johnny Depp, describing his introduction to the cocaine industry in the motion picture Blow. Introduction. Juvenile crime is a serious problem in modern American society. In 2000, law enforcement agencies throughout the United States made approximately 2.4 million arrests of juveniles under the age of 18, or approximately one arrest for every 10 individuals between the ages of 13 and 18. More than 500,000 of these arrests were for property crimes, more than 200,000 were for drug-related violations, and almost 100,000 were for violent crimes. On any given day in 1999, over 100,000 juvenile offenders were being held in residential placement. Part 5. Policy Considerations Given the strong and robust evidence of reinforcing peer effects in correctional facilities, two policy-related issues merit further examination. The optimal assignment of individuals to facilities and how peer quality is distributed across individuals and facilities. With regards to optimal assignment, our results point to two broad conclusions. First, because the social interactions estimated in juvenile correction facilities flow more readily from older to younger individuals, assignment policies that aim to reduce the exposure of young individuals to their older peers may substantially diminish the transfers of crime-related human capital from one cohort to the next. Well, they're not practicing this, are they? Which brings us back to the GEA, GAO Human Capital, a self-assessment checklist for agency leaders. Strategic planning. Establish the agency's mission, vision for the future, core values, goals, and objectives and strategies. High performance organizations begin by defining what they want to accomplish and what kind of organization they want to be. They define a shared vision, i.e. a mission, a vision for the future, core values, core goals and objectives and strategies. 
and communicate that shared vision clearly, constantly, and consistently. From NIJ.gov, the National Institute of Justice, Practical Implications of Current Domestic Violence Research for Law Enforcement, Prosecutors, and Judges. Chapter 3, Offender Characteristics. What is their gender? Although some sociological research based on self-reporting find, finds equal rates of male and female partner conflict, including mostly ma minor physical assaults, behavior that is likely to violate most state and federal criminal and civil protective order statutes, is typically perpetrated by males. Okay, that, that statement alone is contradictory. And the reason for this is these are their directives. Implications for law enforcement. If the ratio of male to female suspects and victims differs substantially from those found above, departments should be alert to potential gender bias. They're saying if you're arresting too many females because you've evidence that they're abusing males, you're probably biased and you need to redesign um, your process or redesign the mindset that you have in order to criminalize males because males hold a higher human capital value than females and the average citizen will not accept the truth about females being the main perpetrator of abuse so by law we're going to play this game and increase the human capital and capital returns to the corporation as an example from unodc.org or the united nations office of on drugs and crime UNODC report on human trafficking exposes modern form of slavery. February 12, 2009, a global report on trafficking in persons. According to the report, the most common form of human trafficking, 79%, is sexual exploitation. The victims of sexual exploitation are predominantly women and girls. Surprisingly, in 30% of the countries which provided information on the gender of traffickers, Women make up the largest proportion of traffickers. In some parts of the world, women trafficking is the norm. Now, they only polled 30% of the countries and asked the gender of the perpetrator. That's what that says. And in 69% of the reports, females were the main perpetrator of child and female sex trafficking from cbc.ca native canadian women sold on u.s ships researchers says report says first nations women from thunder bay ontario trafficked in sex trade in minnesota an american researcher says first nations women from thunder bay ontario have been sold on ships in the harbor of duluth minnesota christine sark said the port of duluth is notorious among first nations people as a site for trafficking women the master's student at the University of Minnesota Duluth said she has anecdotal reports of women, teenage girls, and boys, as well as babies, being sold on ships for sex. From the characteristics of children missing from care, several studies, B. Hall and Wade, 2002, Courtney and Wong, 1996, Fazulo et al., 2002, and Florida Department of Law Enforcement, 2002, Smith 2002, have examined the demographic characteristics of children missing from care. Now Smith 2002 compiled data on the individual, family, and child welfare characteristics that predict running away after initial placement foster care intake and the timing of running once in care. Now Smith used a sample of foster youth from Wisconsin and Minnesota ages 11 to 18 with at least three months in foster care. Significant findings include Considerable evidence shows that running away is a common problem among adolescents in foster care. Runaways from foster care are at risk of a host of short and long-term negative outcomes regarding their physical and emotional well-being and adjustment. Running away increases more sharply over time for males than for females. Native Americans are twice as likely to run away as whites. Among males, Native Americans are five times more likely to run away than whites. For girls, emancipation decreased the likelihood of running. For boys in long-term foster care, the risk of running was twice that of reunification. Youth with higher child behavior checklist scores on externalizing behaviors were more likely to run. The addition of just one risk factor on a list of factors the study identified increased the likelihood of running by 8%.
Now I hope everybody's realizing here that this is a ringer. This is how they explain away child sex trafficking and female sex trafficking maintained by the corporate entity. Going back to the report on cbc.ca. The women and children, and I've had women talk about a couple babies brought onto the ships and sold to the men on ships, are being sold or are exchanging sex for alcohol, a place to stay, drugs, money, and so forth, Stark said. It's quite shocking. Stark said the sex trade on ships has been going on for generations and includes indigenous women from Canada. Now, what they're doing is they can take off-color children through the Department of Health and Human Services, through the Child Protection Services systems, and nobody's looking because they're off-color. You have been taught to dehumanize each other. You've been taught to denature each other, to believe in racism, to believe in gender identities, cultural identities, and religious indoctrination in order to be pit and polarized against each other so that the corporation can traffic your children and females, males. Slave labor is just absolutely abhorrent. However, that's what the corporation is doing, is male slave, slave labor, female and children, child sex trafficking. It's all run through the corporations maintained by, of course, corporate counsel, appearing to be charitable. They are taking advantage of your charitable nature and your ignorance of the law and what they are actually doing. So what do we do now? You're witnessing human trafficking maintained and perpetrated by the Corporation Council for the benefit of corporations. What happens next? Well, first, the media run by the Broadcasting Board of Governors, of course, which has international control of the civilian media, presents to you that it's you. It's not a corporation, right? And so you scream and you go petition Congress and you go petition Senate and the House of Representatives for help and you lobby for help, when in reality it's them. It's the corporation doing this. Now the back end is what's most disgusting because now that they've presented to you that there's human trafficking going on, they need to diagnose the victims of such. From the International Statistical Classification of Diseases and Related Health Problems, 10th Revision, ICD-10 Version for 2010, Chapter 21, Factors Influencing Health Status and Contact with Health Services, Z00 through Z13, Persons Encountering Health Services for Examination and Investigation, Z20 through Z29, Persons with potential health hazards related to communicable diseases. Of course, they're going to get STDs when they're being trafficked by each other. Z30 to Z39. Persons encountering health services in circumstances related to reproduction. Okay, we're going to come up with a whole bunch of pregnant teens, right? Pregnant females, people who are being sex trafficked through the system. Z40 through Z54. Persons encountering health services for specific pre procedures and healthcare. They've been traumatized. Z55 through Z65. Persons with potential health hazards related to socioeconomic and psychosocial circumstances. So when they report that this is indigenous people who are suffering from this, low-income individuals suffering from this, that's so they can diagnose them and cash in on the back end. Z70 through Z76. Persons encountering health services in other circumstances, and Z80 through Z99, persons with potential health hazards related to family and personal history and certain conditions influencing health status. Victims of domestic violence, for example. So the court will diagnose you as injured. Injured means to be brought into law. They brought you into law. They injured you. They injured your children. They injured the females. They injured the males. And it's a constant generation of revenue maintained, of course, through the National Security Act and national policy maintaining corporate welfare. You are the product maintaining corporate welfare, meaning that all of these monies generated through diagnosis, front end is the kidnapping aspect, human trafficking aspect, back end is the diagnosis. This is used to maintain corporate welfare. Who's directing this? The Association of Corporate Counsel. 
The Association of Corporate Counsel is a global bar association that promotes the common professional and business interests of in-house counsel who work for corporations, associations, and other private sector organizations through information, education, networking opportunities, and advocacy initiatives. It looks charitable. From NewsOK.com, missing 78 children from Oklahoma Department of Human Services custody. 78 children in custody of the Oklahoma Department of Human Services are missing. 38 of them have been missing for more than three months. There are no Amber Alerts being issued. There are no missing kids reports other than this. Somebody delved into this. What is the purpose of this? Corporate welfare. They've already indoctrinated you to believe these kids go missing because they ran away. They are not running away. They're being entered into their child sex trafficking schematic maintained by corporate counsel and otherwise known as the Board of Commissioners. Now you've got two commission states at play, but they all maintain corporate welfare for the corporations by doing what they're doing. This is all policy, corporate policy. Stop patronizing this thing. Stop calling it your father and move. Get up. Stand. These are our babies. These are our females. These are our males. Enough is enough. Rocco Show, everything legal plus more. You never know what you're going to hear on the Bill and Rocco Show at Revolution Radio, freedomslips.com. Is there some kind of magic status that will keep you safe from quasi-government intervention? Are there really multiple types of citizens? Doesn't matter if you're a citizen of the national state or the federal state. Is there such thing as a sovereign state? Should you claim constitutional rights? Here at the Bill and Rocco Show, we still maintain divesting off title, do no harm, indict those that do harm as a sovereign state under 28 U.S.C. Chapter 97. You're tuned into freedomslips.com, Revolution Radio. Ever feel as though human beings are being farmed? You know, your food is chosen by the FDA. You're told what drugs you can take, what drugs you can't take, what drugs you must take. Your productive value is harvested from you daily. Sales tax, income tax, property tax, utility bills, mortgages, interest payments. When you exercise a bit of freedom on feed or food, traveling or other matters, the farmer cracks down on you. Ever thought of leaving the farm? Learn how. Join Pat and Tammy for Leaving the Farm, Saturdays, 6 to 8 p.m. Eastern Time, on Revolution Radio at freedomslips.com, Studio A. See you there, or at the feed trough. I'm back to National Security Memo, memo of Dr. Henry Kissinger, number four. UN estimates use the 3.6 billion population of 1970 as a base. There are nearly 4 billion now, and project from about 6 billion to 8 billion people for the year 2000 with the U.S. medium estimate at 6.4 billion. The U.S. medium projections show a world population of 12 billion by 2075, which implies a five-fold increase in South and Southeast Asia and in Latin America, and a seven-fold increase in Africa compared with a doubling in East Asia and 40% increase in the pre presently developed countries. Most demographers, including the UN and the US Population Council, regard the range of 10 to 13 billion as the most likely level for world population stability, even with intensive efforts at fertility control. From gender related effects of expanded adult male circumcision programs in Southern Africa, the impact of power dynamics and potential risk compensation on heterosexual HIV transmission, cat. Kyeen M. Anderson, MD, PhD, Postdoctoral Fellow, Division of Health Policy and Administration, Yale School of Public Health. Co authors Douglas K. Owens, MD, and A. David Paltiel, PhD. Background Male circumcision is being added to comprehensive HIV prevention programs, prevention of AIDS, by telling African males that if they got circumcised, they would not get AIDS, which is part of the depopulation program. 
Current HIV prevention is not enough. 7,400 new infections per day, says UNAIDS 2008. Prevention, preventative vaccines and microbicides not yet available. And the most prominent here is adult male circumcision, an effective vaccine available now. Affordable, safe, acceptable. So they're pitching this crap. I'm reading on. Adequacy of world food supplies, number five. Growing populations will have a serious impact on the need for food, especially in the poorest, fastest growing LDCs. While under normal weather conditions and assuming food production growth in line with recent trends, total world agricultural production shortage could expand faster than population. There will nevertheless be, a serious, be serious problems in food distribution and financing, making shortages even at today's poor nutrition levels probable in many of the larger, more populous LDC regions. Even today, 10 to 20 million people die each year due directly or indirectly to malnutrition. Even more serious is consequence of major crop failures, which are likely to occur from time to time. From Britannica.com, geoengineering, the large-scale manipulation of a specific process central to controlling Earth's climate for the purpose of obtaining a special benefit. Global climate is controlled by the amount of solar radiation received by Earth and also by the fate of this energy within the Earth system. That is, how much is absorbed by the Earth's surface and how much is reflected or re-radiated back into space. The reflectance of solar radiation is controlled by several mechanisms, including Earth's surface, albedo, and cloud coverage, and the presence in the atmosphere of greenhouse gases such as carbon dioxide. If geoengineering proposals are to influence global climate in any meaningful way, they must intentionally alter the relative influence of one of these controlling mechanisms, such as cloud seeding. Now, they're controlling the water supplies by controlling the rain cloud seeding. It controls where the water falls. The International, International Monetary Fund controls the scarcity of all known currency, maintaining that they control the in, inflation rates as well. So they're, they're promoting starvation and famine by controlling geoengineering and controlling the financial markets. Number six, the most serious consequences for short middle term is a possibility of massive famines in certain parts of the world, especially the poorest regions. World needs for food rise by 2.5% or more per year, making a more modest allowance for improved diets and nutrition at a time when readily available fertilizer and well-watered land is already largely being utilized. Therefore, additions to food production must come mainly from higher yields. Countries with large population growth cannot afford constantly growing imports, but for them to raise food output steadily by 2 to 4 percent over the next generation or two is a formidable challenge. Capital and foreign exchange requirements for intensive agriculture are heavy and are aggravated by the energy cost increases and fertilizer scarcities and price rises. Now who did that? Fertilizer was made unlawful when the FBI went into the Oklahoma City bombing um, the truck and blame the uh, fall guy for that one. Um, capital and foreign exchange requirements for intensive agriculture are heavy. This is agrarian economics. It's the same thing that, that uh, brought down Rome, brought down Greece, everything else. So they, they allow the farm animals to have some land for a short amount of time and then they just raise it and take it all back. You cannot industrialize unless you destroy something first, raise it to the ground, burn it to the ground. This is economically efficient according to national policy. And I'll read on. The institutional, technical, and econ economic problems of transforming tradition agriculture are also very difficult to overcome. That's because of the indoctrination. Uh, look up conservatism uh, and, and likewise, you know, they, they rely on the premise of concepts, you believe these things, you're holding on to these concepts, and they're raising you and everybody else. Seven, in addition, in some overpopulated regions, rapid population growth presses on a fragile environment in ways that threaten longer-term food production, 
through cultivation of marginal, marginal lands, overgrazing, decertification, that's Congress, deforestation, that's Congress, and soil erosion, that's also Congress. If you look at the, from the foundations, the Corps of Engineers, um, they're maintaining their control across the board to raise everything and hold everything tight to their chest so they can sell it back to you. And I'll read on. With consequent destruction of land and pollution of water, rapid uh, siltation of reservoirs, and impairment of inland and coastal fisheries. Now, the pollution comes from the corporations. You're still under corporate governance. Um, they buy and sell carbon tax credits, as you know, which do nothing. That was through the Environmental Protection Agency to protect human beings and other life on this planet. And you've got BP with the Gulf oil spill. You've got Fukushima right now. I mean, this is ridiculous. This is them doing these things. Minerals and fuel. Number eight, rapid population growth is not in itself a major factor in pressure on depletable resources. Fossil fuels and other minerals, since demand for them depends more on levels of industrial output than on numbers of people. On the other hand, the world is increasingly dependent on mineral supplies from developing countries. And if rapid population frustrates their prospects for economic development and social project progress, the resulting instability may undermine the conditions for expanded output and sustained flows of such resources. They just called you useful, useless bread gobblers like they did during Nazi Germany. Number nine, there will be serious problems for some of the poorest LDCs with rapid population growth. growth. They will increasingly find it difficult to pay for needed raw materials and energy because Congress is holding them to close to their chest. Corporate governance is, is maintaining the, the hold on these things. You can't afford anything because they've controlled everything. You're in a little box. Fertilizer vital for their own agricultural production will be difficult to obtain for the next few years. They made it so. Imports for fuel and other materials will cause great problems which would impinge on the U.S. both through the need to supply greater financial support and in LDC efforts to obtain better terms of trade through higher prices for exports. They just told you they're going to increase inflation rates to make it really hard on you to live so that you'll hate each other. I mean, this is part of the depopulation program is to make you hate that other guy. He, he's, he's breathing my air. She's breathing my air. That old lady over there, well, they're just, they're not productive. They're not a productive member of society anymore. Okay, eugenics, here we come. And, and now we call it all sorts of stuff. Euthanasia programs where it sounds so pretty. And abortion, it sounds so pretty. It doesn't sound like murder to me. This is sick. Economic development and population growth. Number 10. Rapid population growth creates a severe drag on rates of economic development otherwise attainable. Sometimes to the point of preserve, preventing any increase in per capita incomes. In addition to the overall impact on per capita incomes, rapid population growth seriously affects a vast range of other aspects of the quality of life important to social and economic progress in the LDCs. Human beings don't matter as much as financial stability according to this memo to the National Security Council. Number 11. Adverse economic factors which generally result from rapid population growth include reduced family savings and domestic investment, increased need for large amounts of foreign exchange for food imports, intensification of severe unemployment and underemployment, the need for large expenditures for services such as dependency support, education, and health which would be used for more productive investment, the concentration of developmental resources on increasing food production is to ensure survival for a larger population rather than on improving living conditions for smaller total numbers. So basically they're telling you that you can't have utopia if you continue to breed. Now 
They they influence the the rates the the uh, birth rates they influence the death rates, and they control our numbers, not to maintain uh, normalized uh, economic interests for the citizens or the human beings in any area, but for the U.S. security, the national security, and what this means for humanity is so so horrifying. Uh, the National Depopulation Program has been implemented. They're killing human beings left and right. They have been for a very, very long time. We just haven't been noticing. And they have bets on such things as death derivatives and bets on productivity itself. You know, you're, you're just farm animals. And um, Congress, for example, Senate and House of Representatives, other administration, they do not live in the places that we live in. They don't live in Scotland. They don't live in the UK. They don't live in in um, the United States Incorporated. They're in the Bahamas and in Borneo and other warm places along the equator where you know it's expensive to live and they know that the average citizen isn't going to be there as well as maintaining under their uh, depopulation program without having any empathy for human beings um, I know that there are so many reports of uh, going to the Bahamas and and you know on a vacation and seeing the the front appearance or the media appearance uh, the calm beaches and, and everything else but then when you go inward into the island you find homeless citizens and slaves that are maintaining uh, perpetual servitude status for these animals I mean it's just it's very 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 disturbing and horrifying number 12 while the gross national product increased per annum at an average rate of 5% in LDCs over the last decade, the population increase of 2.5% reduced average annual per capita growth rate to only 2.5%. In many heavily populated areas, this rate was 2% or less. In the LDCs hardest hit by the oil crisis with an aggregate population of 800 million, Gross national product increases may be reduced to less than 1% per capita per year for the remainder of the 1970s. For the poorest half of the populations of these countries with average incomes of less than $100, the prospect is for no growth or retrogression for this period. Again, Congress controls the inflation rate. Congress controls the supply and demand. and Congress is starving people to death and creating famine, homelessness, hunger, and death by the elements. Number 13. If significant progress can be made in slowing population growth, the positive impact on growth of the gross national product and per capita income will be significant. Moreover, economic and social progress will probably probably contribute further to the decline in fertility rates. 14. High birth rates appear to stem primarily from a inadequate information about and availability of means of fertility control. Inadequate motivation for reduced numbers of children combined with motivation for many children re resulting from still high infant and child mortality and need for support in old age and c the slowness of change in family preferences in response to changes in the environment now in any normal biology in any natural biology in its state of being it reacts to influences upon it what it sees so if you have um, the deer populace for example if deers are noticing a reduction in their populace they will breed until they control the populace again increase the numbers um, in relation to the resources available. Humanity has not been able to do that in any way, shape, or form since the introduction of the media. The media has shown you a decline in birth rates through the media accounts of the Korean War, World War I, World War II, uh, 
uh, Vietnam, the, uh, you know, the Gulf War, all of these things are influencing you and influencing um, human birth rates themselves. However, there's also biological deficiencies that are known now since the implementation of the National Security Program to cull our population. Um, they're, they're maintaining that males should wait until they're about 34 years old to get married. By that time, they're usually sterile. We've got the introduction of immunizations with ther uh, thermosol, which is a derivative of mercury. We've got mercury in fish, we've got mercury in so many products that we're consuming that by the time the male is 34 years old, he's already sterile. This forces, this is force for IVF services or in vitro fertilization services for females. What this does is it creates product for Congress to use as these now single mothers are breeding. Um, for example, there is an attorney in New York, I think it was, um, that had 150 children by sperm donation during the time that he was in law school. These children don't have nuclear families. They don't have a natural biological state that they're in, and so they are relying on the state. This is Congress's product. This is judicial product. Um, according to fiscal policy. Number 15, the universal objective of increasing the world standard of living dictates that economic growth outpace population growth. Kissinger is maintaining here that that is the highest priority of foreign policy is maintaining that economic stability, economic security to the detriment of humanity. In many high population growth areas of the world, the largest proportion of gross national product is consumed with only a small amount saved. Thus, a small proportion of gross national product is available for investment with the engine of economic growth. Most experts agree that with fairly constant costs per accept or expenditures, on effective family planning services are generally one of the most cost-effective investments for an LCD, LDC country seeking to improve overall welfare and per capita economic growth. Economic growth. This is according to fiscal policy again. It's, it's not humanity or life. This is depopulation and you're witnessing it. We cannot wait for overall modernization and development to produce lower fertility rates naturally since this will undoubtedly take many decades in most developing countries during which time rapid population growth will tend to slow development and widen even more the gap between the rich and poor. Which brings us to the Office of Population Affairs as established by Henry Kissinger during this time in 1975. I'd like to show everybody the Embryo Adoption Awareness Program. The Embryo Adoption Awareness Program, the Office of Population Affairs, OPA, within the Office of the Assistant Secretary of Health, or OASH, is responsible for administering the Frozen Embryo Adoption Public Awareness Campaign. The campa campaign supports grants, cooperative agreements and or contracts which aim to increase public awareness of embryo donation and adoption. The program may also fund projects that provide services to make this family building option more attainable for infertile individuals. In the course of treatments for infertility, couples usually produce more embryos than they can use. These Supernumerary embryos are generally frozen while the couple who created them decides about their ultimate disposition. This freezing process is known as cryopreservation. The latest data suggests that there are more than 600,000 cryopreserved embryos in the United States Incorporated. However, it is likely that the vast majority of these cryopreserved embryos are still being considered for use in family building efforts of the couples who created them. Moreover, 
Some embryos are earmarked by the creating couples for use in research. Nevertheless, it is thought that there may be as many as 60,000 frozen embryos which could potentially be made available for embryo adoption, i.e. the transfer of the embryo to the uterus of a woman who intends to bear a child and to be that child's parent. The ultimate purpose of the program is to promote the use of embryo donation as a family building option. Right now, in the year 2013, we are in this, we are in this war, we are part of this war. And when males are sterilized or sterile by the time they're 34 years old, if females are experiencing reproductive problems as well, this state, the United States Incorporated, through action of Congress, has maintained a qualification program by which you can breed. What the embryo adoption program does is forces you through soft cell force to qualify to have children now. It's not like this soft cell of China with its two or uh, one child policy. This policy requires you to be qualified before you can even have children. In this perpetual eugenics program, the Office of Population Affairs established by Henry Kissinger in 1975 is inside of the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. And back to the National Security Memorandum 200 by Henry Kissinger, number 16. The interrelationships between development and population growth are complex and not wholly understood. Certain aspects of economic development and modernization appear to be more directed, re directly related to lower birth rates than others. Thus, certain development programs may bring a faster demographic transition to lower fertility rates than other aspects of development. The World Population Plan of Action adopted at the World Population Conference recommends that countries working to affect fertility levels should give priority to development programs and health and education strategies which have a decisive effect on fertility. International cooperation should give priority to assisting such as national efforts. These programs include a improved health care and nutrition to reduce child mortality, education and improved social status for women, increased female employ employment, improved old age security, and assistance for the rural poor who generally have the highest fertility with actions to redistribute income and resources including providing privately owned farms. Family court and probate court is a redistribution effort to redistribute all known family assets into their coffers by the action of hearts and minds through low intensity conflict efforts. Low intensity conflict is the use of military forces applied selectively and with restraint to enforce compliance with the policies or objectives of the political body controlling the military force. The term can be used to describe conflicts where at least one or both of the opposing parties operate along such lines. The Army Manual says successful LIC or low intensity conflict operations consistent with United States incorporated interests and laws can advance U.S. international goals such as the growth of freedom, democratic institutions, and free market economies. U.S. policy recognizes that direct rather, indirect rather than direct applications of U.S. military power are the most appropriate and cost-effective ways to achieve national goals in an LIC environment. This means CPS services. This means adult protection services. This means legal process, family court, probate court. This is low intensity conflict. Winning hearts and minds is a concept occasionally expressed in the resolution of war, insurgency, and other conflicts in which one side seeks to prevail not by the use of superior force, but by making emotional or intellectual appeals to sway supporters to the other side. The, term, the use of the term hearts and minds to reference a method of bringing a subjugated population on side was first used during the Malayan emergency by the British who employed practices to keep the Malayans trust and reduce a tendency to side with ethnic, ethnic Chinese communists. 
in this case by giving medical and food aid to the Malays and indigenous tribes. A British report of the time stated one impressive result of this campaign has been the extent to which Malay women are now taking part in political and social affairs. And back to the memorandum. However, one cannot proceed simply from identification of relationships to specific large-scale operational programs. For example, we do not yet know of cost-effective ways to encourage increased female employment. Now they do. Everybody knows that. Particularly if we are concerned about not adding to male unemployment. We do not yet know what specific packages of programs will be most cost-effective in many situations. Number 17. There is need for more information on cost effectiveness of different approaches on both the supply and the demand side of the picture. On the supply side, intense efforts are required to assure full availability by 1980 of birth control information and means to all fertile individuals, especially in rural areas. Planned Parenthood came right back in, didn't they? And this is through the Office, Office of Population Affairs. Planned Parenthood was originally a eugenics program. Hitler really liked it. Improvement is also needed in methods of birth control most acceptable and is usable by the rural poor. On the demand side, further experimentation and implementation action projects and programs are needed. In particular, more research is needed on the motivation of the poorest who often have the highest fertility rates. Assistance programs must be more precisely targeted to this group than in the past. Now, the poorest has always been determined by Congress or rules of civility, rules of whatever, but it does, it's not conducive, that is not conducive to humanity. The poorest of the population are animals. They're, they're without all of this indoctrination. They're having children because they love children. They're not having children because they want the benefits of having children. They're not having babies to seek any glory or glamour or entitlement until now, until the time when they are indoctrinated and specifically targeted by low intensity conflict, hearts and minds, through the preceding actions of control of the inflation rates, hunger, everything else. So everybody's forcing now or being forced into depopulating themselves. You know, I, and I, I remember when I was 30, I, I would say, well, I'm not having any children after age 30 because I just can't afford it. Why not? Who, who forces these things? Who's, who's manipulating and controlling these things by which to control us? They control the children. They, they control birth control. They control... Um, our birth right rates themselves. They control the supply and demand of all of our resources. They control the inflation rate. Um, everything on this planet is under the control of Congress and we need to get Congress out of our lives. This is not natural humanity. This is something that's created as as a fiction. It's it's so... This is unreal. It's, it's a nightmare. Political effects of population factors. Number 19. The political consequences of current population factors in the LDCs, rapid growth, internal migration, high percentages of young people, slow improvement in living standards, urban concentrations, and pressures for foreign migration are damaging to the internal stability and international relations of countries in whose advancement the United States Incorporated is interested. Thus, creating political or even national security problems for the U.S., in a broader sense, there is a major risk of severe damage to world economic, political, and ecological systems, and as these systems begin to fail to our human, humanitarian values. Number 20. The pace of inter internal migration from countryside to overswollen cities is greatly intensified by rapid population growth. Enormous burdens are placed on LDC governments for public administration, sanitation, education, police and other services and urban slum dwellers, though apparently not recent migrants, may serve as a volatile, violent force which threatens political stability. Now, the crime rate is actually maintained by a disparity of the classes. So when they're doing the urban development programs, rural resource programs, uh, and such, they're actually creating that 
disparity based on classification. That is one of the rules of genocide. From genocidewatch.org, The Eight Stages of Genocide, by Gregory H. Stanton, President, Genocide Watch. Classification, Symbolization, Dehumanization, Organization, Polarization, Preparation, Extermination, and Denial. Genocide is a process that develops in eight stages that are predictable but not inexorable. At each stage, preventative measures can stop it. The process is not linear. Logically, later stages must be preceded by earlier stages, but all stages continue to operate throughout the process. Number one, classification. All cultures have categories to distinguish people into us and them by ethnicity, race, religion, or nationality, German and Jew, Hudu and Tutsi, bipolar socius societies and lack, that lack mixed categories such as Rwanda and Burundi are the most likely to have genocide. The main preventative measure at this early stage is to develop universalistic institutions that transcend ethnic or racial divisions that actively promote tolerance and understanding and that promote classifications that transcend the division. Well, not really. Don't don't accept the name. I'm not white. I'm not black. I'm not green. I'm not yellow. I'm not red. I'm not brown. I'm not female. I'm not male. I'm not anything. I'm not classified. I am the United States of being. Number two, symbolization. We give names or other symbols to the classifications. We name people Jews or gypsies or distinguish them by colors or dress and apply the symbols to members of groups. Dehumanization. Number three, one group denies the humanity of the other group. Members of it are equated with animals, vermin, insects, or diseases, exactly like Congress is promoting through the Broadcasting Board of Governors and specifically such as the Southern Poverty Law Center maintaining racial disparity and you know what is promoted in the media. Recently in, in Georgia, a, a male black child was killed in a school rolled up in a mat and the Georgia Bureau of Investigation said it was natural causes. The Department of Justice came in said it wasn't going to investigate after another autopsy was performed and found that child was in fact murdered but they're pushing the racial disparity or the racial divide. The child was murdered by the FBI in order to promote racism when in reality human beings aren't racist, they love everybody and they're playing into these games. Uh, politics is all this is. Number four, organization. Genocide is always organized, usually by the state, often using militias to provide deniability of state responsibility. Plausible deniability. We went over that in part of uh, the National Security Program the other day on my YouTube channel. Number five, polarization. Extremists drive their groups apart. Okay, so you have masculists and you have feminists and Zionists and Islamists and you've got all these different individuals being polarized from each other. That guy over there is eating all your food. That guy's taking your jobs and it's all maintained by Congress. You have to stop accepting these things and especially when there's extremists infiltrating very, very specific groups. So if you're um, in a group of sovereign individuals or sovereign states, you'll find that the FBI will infiltrate, the CIA will infiltrate, and try to promote hatred t towards another group. Uh, you need to be aware of that and what false flag taxes, tactics are, as well as whisper campaigning. Number six, preparations. Victims are identified and separated out because of their ethnic or religious identity. Again, Islamism, Zionism, Judaism, Catholicism, all it takes is a name and we're separated and that's how they prepare. They're, they're driving us to the edge of the herd in order to pick us off as a predator. Number seven, extermination begins and quickly becomes mass killing legally called genocide. This is what's happening in Syria right now. The national security policy dictates that we need more human product we need more human workers, we need more uh, human resources, we need more natural resources, so we're going to enter into their country, slaughter them, blame them for it, 
and offer them the cure, which is what Americans are used to. That is what they're used to. That is what everybody's used to. Congress is destroying everything. Congress is raising everything and then offering you a cure. Stop accepting it. And of course, denial number eight is the eighth stage that always follows a genocide. It is among the surest indicators of further genocidal massacres. That means that you fall back on cognitive dissonance and you rely on the patriotism that you're used to to your state that's killing you. Stop patronizing it. This is really happening. It's happening now. I'm showing you. You're evidencing it happening. Please don't fall back on cognitive dissonance. Believe what you're seeing. Know yourself. Know thyself. Number 21. Adverse socioeconomic conditions generated by these and related factors may contribute to high and increasing levels of child abandonment, abandonment juvenile delinquency, chronic and growing underemployment and unemployment, petty thievery, organized brigandry, food riots, separatist movements, communal massacres, revolutionary actions and counter-revolutionary coups, such conditions also distract from the environment needed to attract the foreign capital vital to increasing levels of economic growth in these areas. If these conditions result in expropriation of foreign interests, such action from an economic viewpoint is not in the best interest of either the investing country or the host government. Now, they have perpetrated all number of malicious lies upon the populace. First of all, the child abandonment, abandonment issues most human beings do not abandon their children, especially the fathers. The fathers have been removed from the child's lives since the 80s uh, after this depopulation program was um, implicated originally in 74, 75. Throughout the 80s, you had uh, no-fault divorce implicated all over the globe, um, specifically in the United States Incorporated itself. And in that, the use of restraining orders to move the father out of the home has been so prolific. And this allows the child to then be product, to be part of the uh, gross national product, gross domestic product. This is sick. We need, we need to back out of this. Juvenile delinquency, I explained that one um, originally in the uh, human uh, capital explanation at the beginning of the program. And... Um, I mean, this is just sick. Unemployment is forced upon us. Underemployment is forced upon us. Uh, petty thievery is not against the law. By the way, those are commercial crimes. If you go to 27 CFR 72.11, they're cashing in on the back end of that as well. So they're charging you, uh, charging you, charging you, charging you. They pledge you for their debt. This is how they're extrapolating you, redistributing all of your assets is through these national uh, security program and directives. Number two, 22, in international relations, population factors are crucial in and often determinants of violent conflicts in developing areas. Congress right now is in Syria. Congress directed the Syrian gassing of uh, upwards of now, I'm, I'm hearing reports of 1,500 Syrian children, and, and they're blaming it on Syrian rebels and Syrian citizenship and, and all this thing. Just know that it stems from the national security policy and don't allow it anymore. Stop allowing these things. And that's our time for this week. We'll try to catch up next week right here on No Borders. to Scottish Sovereigns on the land and the home of No Borders Radio.